Well, coming to Philippians 2, I'm just plowing through this thing. Uh, and um, we're coming to a section that uh, when you're under accusation is not always the most comforting read. And um, this passage used to really, at different times in my life, bother me. Um, and it's, it, it's amazing. Um, because, well, it's an exhortation to virtue in a way. It's not really, but it looks like an exhortation to virtue. And the enemy loves to feed it to you when there's no environment where that virtue is appropriate. And then he likes to condemn you for not exhibiting it in contexts where it wouldn't work. <laughs> uh, and I thank the Lord that uh, I see more clearly now than I ever have about these things. Um, so he's been talking about their outward stand to be walking in a manner worthy of the gospel and in uh, nothing terrified of the enemies or the adversaries, right? But with all boldness, uh, preaching the gospel, standing fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And this is a militant stance towards the adversaries. It's a strong stance. It's a unity uh, of an army, right? Um, standing in rank, uh, facing the opposition. Um, and there's suffering there because it's war. Um, and he uses, he says, um, standing fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together. That's, uh, that's unity, right? That's a militant kind of unity in the gospel. Well, chapter two is also about a unity, but it's more of the atmosphere in the fellowship kind of unity. It's the inward unity under the armor. See, there's the armor that we're wearing to face the adversaries. But then under the armor, there's our real heart. And there's a unity there, too, in the fellowship um, that's sweeter and more of a family atmosphere. You can be an army and a family at the same time in God's house, you know. Um, and the virtue that he describes in here, if you have a sensitive conscience and you've been accused at different times of pride because of your Bible knowledge, <laughs> which is really just your pursuit of the truth, um, you can look at these verses and go, that's not me at all, and really get condemned. So let's just read them, and then we'll answer it. Um, if there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now that sounds like being of the same, uh, standing fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, right? But this is more in your living uh, and in the fellowship. He's not talking about the fight here. He's talking about when you take the armor off, what's underneath in your relationships to each other, where you're not dealing with the adversaries, but you're dealing with your family in Christ. Um, fulfill you that my joy that you be like-minded having the same love being of the one accord of one mind let nothing do be done through 
strive for vain glory, but in lowliness of mind each esteem one another better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the death of the cross. Uh, usually when I've heard this taught at a church, it starts at about verse 3. Don't do anything through strife, vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Esteem everybody else better than you. And don't look at your own affairs, but everybody else, the things, uh, things of others. And then let this mind be in you. And it's about humbling yourself and this is always from pastors perspective a lot of times a way to encourage you to stop being selfish and considering your own needs when there's so much work to be done around here <laughs> um and you think that's not me at all i don't feel any of these things i don't think of these other people as better i think of them almost like strangers I don't I don't I guess I just can't walk in love there must be something wrong with my love walk and um, again that is because you're being called to unity where there should actually be the consideration that there sorry I haven't spoken yet this morning so I'm trying to get words out and I'm having a uh, the you're you're being called to unity with people that are adversaries of the gospel. <laughs> Basically, this is not what God wants, and and it's being framed as an accusation against you. Typically, in a context where there are no one, where you're all alone. You know, you're not standing with the saints of God who are all similarly equipped with the gospel and contending for our freedom in Christ but you're surrounded by a system that pretends to be the church but is actually set up in opposition against the gospel and against the saints and it's saying you need to be humble and you need to be in lowliness of mind and you need to stop thinking about yourself and you need to walk in love towards others and you need to have unity. We're supposed to be one accord. And then they say, look what happened in Acts 2. What could we do if we were just united and all the petty bickering would stop, right? Be the biggest revival in the history of the world. All that is is guilt trips and manipulation. Um, now, Paul is writing to people he assumes are fighting the same fight he's fighting and experiencing the same conflict that he's experiencing. They're fellow partakers with him of grace. They're defending and contending the gospel for the gospel, and they're not at all ashamed or afraid in the face of their adversaries. They're bold. Okay. Then he says, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort and love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now, in the exhortation in Philippians 1, where he's urging them to fight, he talks about being of one mind first. But here he's talking about being of one love. This is a heart thing first, you know. And it comes out of comfort in Christ. Consolation there is, is based on the word paraclete, uh, which is Christ is our comforter. Um, or encourager. You know, when you're fighting for the gospel, if you're standing, it's because Christ is encouraging you. Those are the times when you know Christ's encouragement the most. You may not realize it because you're so focused on the fight, 
but afterwards when you sit down and you look back at what you did you go wow Christ was standing with me and encouraging me through that otherwise I would have backed down you know then based on that there's a comfort and love and it's not your love it's his love for you if any bowels and mercies if any fellowship of spirit this is an atmosphere of fellowship okay based on encouragement and comfort this is comforted hearts who are satisfied with Christ um, and bowels and mercies there remember he already said God is my witness how I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ he's not talking about their affections he's talking about their experience of Christ's love is now flowing towards each other he's saying if this is there don't even don't even go read on to the next exhortation if this isn't there if it's not there you're not in the right environment something's not right you know so it's all based it's predicated on this environment that's supplied by the spirit of jesus christ in the fellowship and each person is being comforted by the lord they know how to draw from the lord for their strength see one problem is many people come to they, they might be in the right environment they come to the church but they don't know how to draw from christ as their strength yet so they look to men to fill their needs and that's not fellowship that is codependency and they get mad when you don't meet their need it's a psychological need for a certain kind of attention or whatever if you don't do the dance in front of them they get offended it's like that's not what we're here for i don't have anything to give you other than christ if you're looking for something other than christ i ain't got it sorry i'm bankrupt that's why i came to christ in the first place so we don't we're not coming expecting to receive from other people we're coming comforted by christ in the first place we're not coming to get supply we're coming as supply uh not that we have anything or can do anything but it's because we know our source is christ not the people that's really important because a lot of people try to fulfill their social needs and their emotional needs with so-called fellowship and it just turns into a therapy group and eventually those things break down and strife because your insecurities are not ministered to in that situation they're actually catered to uh, and exaggerated and strengthened so eventually it starts to dissolve in kind of paranoia and strife and backbiting and little side conversations well when that person said this did did you get the feeling they meant this and that's not fellowship this is based on consolation in christ for each person comfort of love and fellowship in the spirit and bowels and mercies which is christ's affections uh and then you fulfill the joy having a like-mindedness having the same love of one accord and of one mind you join together with others who have the same comfort same consolation same fellowship and same bowels not to different degrees because of growth you know but we understand that christ is the source and we're learning how to lay hold of him and that's why we're together we want to encourage each other to lay hold of christ the Colossians says it's holding the head out from whom the whole body grows it's not holding each other to be built up it's not horizontal it's vertical fellowship comes from the Lord not from people but it does spill out to people and include them but you're not on the receiving end of that fellowship you're on the giving end um, it's you come to him and drink and out from your innermost being should flow rivers of living water it's out from you that it flows not into you it's already in you when you come to him and drink you're coming to a fountain that's already there you have access to him when you're with people or when you're alone you don't need other people see what I'm not saying is don't be selfish 
I'm saying recognize the source of your supply. You will not receive supply from people. You'll receive it from the Lord. And you can have him at any time. You are not in bondage to having to go to the temple in Jerusalem or go to a mountain in Samaria or go to some local church. You can have him at any time as comfort, consolation, love, fellowship, bowels and mercies right now. Then when you come to others in that spirit, something's flowing out of you. And when you put a bunch of people together out from whom that is flowing, there is a rich, comforting supply that is the atmosphere of Christ in our hearts. Uh, corporately, not individually. This is not for the individual, this is corporate. Okay. Hope this makes sense. Um, now, the substitute or the imitation that Jezebel has produced through the institutional church and through people is to adulterate your affections, adulterate your heart, and try to make you feel like you have to give these virtues, develop these virtues towards things that are not the body of Christ. Either enemies of the gospel or a system. As if you could walk in love towards a system. You know, you need to forgive the system and give to the system and come to the system and sit in the system. Ah. It's a system, it's not people. Or straight out enemies of the gospel. You know, the adversaries of the gospel always come and say, well, they're, they're prideful and arrogant and not walking in love towards us. No. It, when it comes to you, I'm instructed to in nothing be terrified by my adversaries. It's a militant stance with you. You don't get the fellowship unless you're in the fellowship. Okay, the gospel produces the fellowship. Uh, in fact, remember he said, you're fellow partakers of my grace because you're contending and defending, contending for and defending the gospel. It's you'll find that it's when you contend for the truth of the gospel that you grow and become strong in the comforts of the Lord. You really start to know the comfort of Christ and the encouragement and the fellowship of the Spirit. Then, then when you come together with saints, it's just a totally different thing. Now the good news is that when you find the right environment, if you've been gospel focused, and the Lord does bring you into fellowship, all this is there. So this is not for you to measure yourself and try to figure out whether you're walking in love or humility. He's talking about a corporate atmosphere. It takes two to tango. It takes the whole church to produce this kind of atmosphere or it takes a fellowship. And it's based on Christ, not based on you and what you can produce by trying to humble yourself. This is talking about people who are satisfied with Christ. They're not trying to get satisfaction from others. They're satisfied with Christ. They know how to come to Him. And they realize that men are all going to let me down. You know, I don't expect anything from you other than the testimony. I'm not looking to you for, to meet any of my needs. And it's not because I think you're worthless. It's because I've learned that Christ is everything. And I have the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, right? See, your church life can even, your fellowship can turn out, work out to salvation through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Corporate salvation. Um, anyway, we want, what we find, and I was thinking about this, is like, no. I have found, for the first time in my Christian life, plenty who are like-minded in the gospel, and we're striving together in the faith and we're being faced by adversaries and we are resisting them steadfastly and we're not giving in we're not taking off our armor we're not making peace with them and and yet and we also have a fellowship that is extremely sweet and these things are just true and i see myself in this fellowship very differently than I've seen myself in among Christians in the past. So Christians in name. And it's not because something was necessarily wrong with me, but because the environment was not the right environment for this kind of fellowship. 
There was no consolation of Christ. There was no contending for the gospel. It wasn't even allowed. There was no comfort and love. There were people pretending to be loving. That is not the same thing. They were not drinking from Christ as the source. They were seeking to satisfy their flesh with each other. The pastor was feeding himself. The worship teams were feeding themselves. And everybody else was starving, you know. But nobody was being fed with Christ. And nobody was feeding anyone with Christ. Again, the environment is really the key. And it's an environment generated from contending for the gospel and partaking together of grace. Uh, and being filled with the spirit of Jesus Christ, the rich supply, right? Okay, so look, let nothing be done in strife and vainglory. See, it's much easier to put it aside. Of course, there could be, I, Petra and I could have a, she could do a video on a topic I wanted to do, let's say. I could say, wait a second, I could do that. Why'd she let me do that, you know? No, that doesn't even hardly creep in. It's so easy to set those things aside that, that still come from the flesh. It's still there. But when you've got the comfort in Christ and you know he's your supply, he is subduing all that stuff, really. But you still need the admonition, you know, look not every man to his own things, but things of others. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Now he was in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now he didn't set aside his glory, essentially. He just hid the glory in the form of a man. We know from the trans transfiguration that his glory was still there, able to radiate out but he had clothed it with the tabernacle of his flesh, just like the glory in the wilderness was hidden in the tabernacle. Now, if you could see what we are, since we've been regenerated, you would see the same thing. And our glorification will be our transfiguration. What is in us essentially, the glory that God sowed into us as a seed will blossom and our whole being will be clothed with life. Uh, the only difference is that we have sin and he didn't. We, our flesh still needs to be crucified. I mean, it was crucified with him, but it needs to be mortified as we walk by the Spirit. Uh, but he made himself no reputation, took on the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of a cross. Now, this is amazing because you think of just the work of his death, but you got to remember... He spent 33 years clothed in flesh, living among the mundane. This is the Ancient of Days, who had angels ministering to him before he incarnated. He endured a whole life of humanity. That boggles my mind. That's hard for me to understand. Because as a musician, I can't tolerate the mundane. I always need something interesting happening. <laughs> And the day-in, day-out grind is what wears you down, more than the fights and the drama. It's really just, the, especially as we know the Lord is coming, the day-in, day-out plodding along is what kills us. <laughs> and Jesus endured that. I think that's every bit is trying. And not only that, but he endured it alone with no one to fellowship with except the Father because no one could understand him. He was rejected of men. Even the ones who wanted to love him couldn't understand him. Right? He's totally alone. A man of sorrows. Uh, for 33 and a half years. <laughs> um, but now, God's highly exalted him. He gave himself over to death. And this is the pattern. But it doesn't say copy him. It says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ. And thought it, he was in the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God. This comes from knowing your position in Christ. It's not false humility where you grovel because you think you're worthless. No, this is a, uh, this is, I know I am seated in the heavenlies in Christ and I am complete in him. I lack nothing in my essence of what I am in Christ. I'm glorious. I don't think it's even robbery to be considered a co-heir with Christ. 
but I don't exercise that privilege and power. I'm happy to be clothed with humility among the saints and not think only of my own things and even serve to comfort others. And we do become a source of comfort, even though what we comfort them with is we teach them how to turn to Christ and not look to us. A lot of people, they want to comfort others, but what they want to do is make themselves the source of comfort and make the, make the people who are comforted their followers. We don't want to do that. No, we're complete in Christ. I don't need anything from you. I'm free. That is a different attitude than the kind of humility we're thinking of, which is, I'm nothing. I, sh I can't do anything. And I'm not even worthy to be. Sorry, guys, I shouldn't have even opened my mouth. Every time I open my mouth, it's the wrong thing to do because I'm so stupid, you know. No, this is like when he, in John 13, when he washed the feet of his disciples, it says Jesus knowing that he came from God and that all things were his from God and that he was going back to God, took off his clothes and girded himself with a towel and washed their feet. <laughs> It comes from acknowledgement of your position in Christ. Look, I've got everything. I don't need anything from these. I don't need their worship. I don't need their adulation. I don't need them to praise me and say all these great things about me. I just, I am full of the love of Christ. And I want to see them washed too. And the last 10 minutes were cut off. I didn't realize I must have hit the button or something. Um, but I was saying that, you know, Jesus knew he had everything. And I hope this isn't repeat, but uh, the example I gave was to show millionaire boss. And that is uh, where business owners will disguise themselves as employees and go, like, let's say they own a franchise of Taco Bells. And they go and they work as, you know, learning how to work in the kitchen at the Taco Bell. And they get to know the people because they're dressed like one of them. And they're sitting there thinking, man, I've got everything. And I'm living like they do on this kind of wage. And this is how they live. And uh, I know their situation and I know their needs and I know their struggle. And yet they keep a positive attitude and come and help me learn my job and encourage me, you know. And at the end of the show, there's usually an unveiling where they reveal, okay, I'm the guy who owns the company and I'm so thankful to know you and know what you go through and here's a car for you and here's scholarships for your kids and he's you know um that is the attitude okay it's coming from a position of wealth and putting on the form of a servant not for anything other than to eventually bring others to a, a, a higher place you know um that comes from the, the comfort of the spirit that comes from the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. It comes from being rich already. It comes from knowing your position in Christ. Okay. So that's the base, the con consolation in Christ, the comfort of love, the fellowship of the spirit, the bowels and mercies are the base. Okay. And what you find is that when you find the right environment, right? where you actually find the people who are contending for the gospel and you stand next to them in your armor and learn to contend with them, you'll also find the fellowship among them. And what's amazing is that you'll suddenly realize, oh my gosh, I'm actually a real Christian. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how to describe this feeling. Um, it's like you've been Pinocchio and you finally became a real boy, you know. Uh, there's only certain environments where the thing works. And when you're in a wrong environment, in an adulterated environment, where things that belong to Zion are being demanded of you by your captives in Babylon, you feel like something's wrong with you. Well, I guess I'm not a real Zionist, you know. I'm not really one of God's people because I just don't feel it. No, you're just in the wrong environment. You're not in Jerusalem, you're in Babylon. When you get to Jerusalem, which is... The place where the gospel is contended for and where there's consolation in Christ and comfort of love and fellowship with the Holy Spirit, things will flow out of you that you just didn't even know were there. 
And you won't realize it until you come to a passage like this and you go, wow, this passage used to condemn me, but I actually recognize it in myself. You know, what brought it out? The fellowship. Uh, and, uh, you know, you could say, no, devil, that's, I, I'm not, I'm not this arrogant blowhard. I was contending for the gospel back then. <laughs> in that environment where you were saying that I was arrogant and didn't love people. No, you caught me among my adversaries. Look how I am with my family. And you go, wow, the scriptures and the admonitions of the scriptures don't feel alien to me. It feels, this is me, it's describing me. And it's so gratifying to go, wow, this is true. Like John says, you know, there's a new commandment which is true in him and in you because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. As he is, so are we also in this world. That's not something that you try to do. That's something that is. Oh, jeez. Stupid dog. Uh. <laughs> so, praise God, that's who we are. And I pray that if you are haven't found that fellowship, that you would find it. Uh not to meet your own needs, but to stand with those who are striving for the gospel so that you can really enjoy everything that's yours. And there's not that many people striving for the gospel. Everybody's trying to shut it down. Um, but we do have this fellowship among us, and it's beautiful. All right, I'm going to go. I hope that this made sense. The last four minutes I had to redo. The, the, the last ten minutes are gone, uh, which were the kind of the peak of the message. And I'm hoping that this isn't just a repeat of something I already said in the message. All right, take care.